Thank you. Um, so the title of my talk, I like that title better. That's the one that's published in the book. But this was the one that was published in the schedule, so it's what I used. But before I begin, I just want to thank the, the rector of the university and the dean um, and the organizing committee, who's worked very hard to pull this event off, for inviting me, and all of you for coming to talk. Or com sorry, coming to listen. But I want you to talk when I'm done. Um, so I was asked to explain to you my research agenda, which is something that most academics find to be a slippery problem at best. So I thought I would start with a little story that might help you to make sense a little bit of the contours of this rather messy research agenda around climate change, resource governance, and the irrational commons. So a few weeks ago, a friend told me that now that I'd become a professor, that I had the right, I'd earned the right to be a little bit eccentric. And I liked this idea a lot. But as I was preparing this talk, I ran into a little snag. And I realized that I wasn't sure if this license to be a little bit odd actually applied to my research agenda or if it only applied to my socks. For you see, I already have this um, well-entrenched habit of asking what we might call, uh, well, shall we just say, inconvenient questions. So questions that I believe try to get at the heart of a research problem, to turn them upside down and allow them to us to look at them in a different way. Um, and on a serious note, I would argue that doing this is vital if we're going to address many of the environmental challenges that we face today. So it was that after nearly 30 years, yes, 30, you heard that correctly, 30 years of work on community forestry in Nepal, I asked, why is it that forests are at the center of community forestry? My natural science colleagues stared. A few of them that know me well rolled their eyes. But this is an important question, I would argue. In Nepal, it's not simply a philosophical one. Why is agriculture not included in our kind of analyses of community forestry? In Nepal, much of the forest ends up in agricultural fields, and the top slide there is a picture of women transplanting rice. People collect leaf litter, and and compost that along with animal dung in order to provide the vast majority of fertilizer for their fields. And a great deal of the food for those animals comes out of the forest, either in the form of fodder, and this woman is up in a tree cutting down a bra green branches, or in the form of uh, grazing in the understory, so they let the animals um, loose. So indeed, we can ask, why is it that forests are at the center of community forestry? If I'm going to study community forestry, what are the questions I need to ask? What are the contours of my research problem? But this is not actually the irrational part of my story. Um, instead, I'm getting to that part. Um, instead, as a social scientist, I insist that we ask questions about which relationships govern resources, forest resources in this case. How are these relationships related to formal policies and institutions? Most often I find that on the ground, these relationships are a bit more kind of unclear, difficult to get our hands on. They don't really conform with the rules, or we might even call them eccentric. So. Instead, I want to ask, what are the social and ecological outcomes of these so-called irrational relationships? And now, of course, you might have already come to know me well enough to realize that I'm playing a little bit with this idea of being irrational. Not all these relationships are irrational. Some, in fact, are at least partially rational. But what I'm referring to here is that relationships don't conform to the assumptions of rational choice theory. That rational choice theory argues that people are self-maximizing, profit-seeking individuals. 
And I think that most of us probably recognize that we only act like this some of the time. In fact, we'd like to believe that we only act like that a little bit of the time. Um, and so instead, what we find are that people want to belong to society. And in order to belong, there's a great deal of pressure on us to cooperate, to be good community members, to maybe only be eccentric about our socks uh, and not around other things that might make others uncomfortable. Um, and so my work seeks to understand how these alternative rationalities can help to explain why sometimes our policies work and sometimes they don't. Community forestry in Nepal is an excellent example of this. It's considered to have some of the best institutional design around community managed forests in the world. And yet, and it has an excellent policy framework. It's very difficult to find much to criticize in the Forest Act. And yet, some groups work really well, and others don't. And the only way we can explain that is when we begin to look at some of these other kinds of rationalities, rationalities that maybe override rational economic thinking, or rationalities that override the kinds of assumptions that are embedded within the programs um, in Nepal. Okay, but by now, I think that all of you are wanting to ask me a rather inconvenient question of your own. Andrea, why are you talking about community forestry? I thought you were going to talk about climate change. Well, it's not really quite as irrational as you might suppose. At the moment in Nepal, community forestry user groups, because of their excellent institutional design, are seen as the right entry point for the implementation of a variety of climate change programs. Most of these are related to uh, adaptation programs that are seeking to kind of govern resources at the local level in a better way. Um, but they're also being targeted for mitigation programs like Red Plus or reducing emissions from deforestation and degradation in order to um, uh, try to sequester carbon in forests of Nepal. Um, and so it is that now I come to climate change. Um, most research on climate change adaptation asks, how can we adapt? There's a great deal of concern in the world today that with the rapid pace of change of biophysical resources, that human societies and our kind of uh, food production systems, our economies, are gonna have a really hard time keeping up with these changes, and that we need to be prepared now to adapt. But for me, in my tendency to ask inconvenient questions, I'm finding this focus on climate change adaptation to be a little bit ungratifying. First of all, this focus on adaptation to climate change is embedded within the definition from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, or what you might better know as the IPCC. And the IPCC specifically defines adaptation as measures that are taken to either mitigate harm or capitalize upon benefits of a changing climate um, that are in addition to other kinds of changes in society. So it's very specifically about climate change itself or the impacts of climate change itself. Um, but I would really quite like to ask, is adaptation the right question? And in fact, I came back from field work in Nepal in December, having done some work specifically looking at how farmers were adapting um, and thought, actually, it's not the right question at all. So let me try to explain to you why. First of all, most adaptation programs are designed around an understanding of farming systems and peasant agriculture that looks and conforms very much to the story I told you at the beginning of this talk. Um, but Himalayan farmers today are in the midst of incredibly rapid rate change. There is massive out-migration from Nepal, such that rural areas have a depopulation rate of young men up to 40%, young men being between the ages of 18 and 40. Um, I had to pay my uh, 
people we hired to help carry our things more than my research assistants because there was literally nobody available to carry work to do that kind of labor for me. Um, education is on the increase, which we all see as a good thing in general, but, it, but on the whole, the, the social consequence of this has been a massive devaluing of farming as an occupation. You're seen to have somehow kind of failed or failed to pass your exams if you end up as a farmer, and it's very much framed that way, ending up as a farmer, as opposed to farming being a, a desired livelihood, a kind of sense of well-being and a place where one might achieve their ambitions in life. There's a massive increase in cheap processed foods coming into people's diets that's changing how people use their farming systems. Um, there are uh, observed changes in the monsoon pattern, which is causing a lot of problems for, for um, agriculture. So now we've, we're kind of firmly in that climate change domain. So this is most certainly part of this equation. Uh, two years ago, the rains came very late during the harvest and destroyed 30% of the ripe rice crop in most of South Asia. So it wasn't just Nepal. Um, there's a massive amount of mechanization. So rather than that hand planting of rice, actually I think they still do that, but before all everything was done by hand or by draft animals, there's now a lot of machinery out in the, in the hills. And this particular tractor was in a place where there isn't a road yet. And I couldn't actually quite figure out how they got it there. I think they might have driven it in rather than helicoptered it in, but it's possible it was helicoptered in. Um, and um, all of this is changing the relationships around farming. So people don't engage in farming in the same way. Um, and in the midst of all this is this proliferation of new user groups to govern resources. And these user groups are based upon an understanding of people that stay in one place, where farming is their primary occupation, and where gender relations conform to some sort of traditional norm that we might associate with South Asia, where men do most of the decision making and women do most of the work, or at least I should say maybe the Himalayas, this is associated with the Himalayas. And this is just really not true anymore. There's far too many changes, a lot of women-headed households with all this out-migration, a lot of kind of mechanization of labor, changing of cropping patterns because of a lack of labor, etc. cetera. Um, and that's the easy part. And then there's politics. Nepal is not, in fact, this peaceful Shangri-La that most people in Western Europe believe it to be. Nepal uh, suffered a civil, or I shouldn't say suffered. Nepal uh, had a civil war between the, the years of 1996 and 2006. It was the bloodiest conflict in South Asia during that time period. Um, the kind of violence we see in Pakistan today is far more violent, so we need to contextualize this. But nevertheless, during that 10-year period, Nepal was where more people were dying and disappearing than anywhere else on the subcontinent. Um, the after 2006, there were um, a, a s elections. There's now been two rounds of elections. Um, and a constitution writing process was I implemented in 2008. That process finally concluded in September last year, which immediately led to the outburst of much more violence. Um, the constitution, very disappointingly, is considered to be quite regressive on a number of, of grounds around um, citizen rights for women, around the inclusion of historically marginalized groups. Um, all of which had been hotly contested through this very drawn out constitution writing process. And earlier drafts of the constitution were much more um, sort of egalitarian in those respects. Um, but during this time period, all of the political attention was focused on national politics. And so my research kind of went in there and tried to look at what was happening at the grassroots. And what we found was that resource governance, namely around forests and roads and some of these new climate change adaptation and mitigation programs, were key sites where some of the most contentious issues connected to the political transition were being fought over. 
sometimes literally with physical violence. I encountered two adult men, in fact, both of whom are now have now passed away uh, from old age, uh, in a fist fight with each other. And this was about nine years ago. So they were certainly the kinds of community leaders that one wouldn't expect getting in a fist fight over who would get to be the president of this new user group that had some external funding attached to it. In other places, um, it's just hear stories of intimidation. Um, but at all times, questions of identity, of belonging to the state, and what the new state ought to be sit at the center of these kind of contested politics. Most often, these kind of split along political party lines, but not always. They're also connected to whether or not different kinds of indigenous groups and historically marginalized people feel recognized and feel that their needs are being taken account of in this kind of new state regime. And these regimes are often seen to be reflected in these kinds of user groups and programs. Is my village going to get a local adaptation plan of action project or not? Because it's politics that decides this. And so as a kind of counter to some of the recent media reports on how climate change causes violence, my work is showing that it's the programs that are being put in place to combat climate change that are much more likely to cause violence than changing resources themselves. Um, and perhaps most importantly, these new projects seek to promote particular ideas of inclusion, justice, and equity. And in effect, they're kind of creating new understandings of citizenship, new understandings of belonging. And given the kind of contested nature of all this in Nepal at the moment, these are not innocent kinds of goals. So the pictures here show you a group of men who are sitting, I tried in my cropping to keep the table in there, so they're sitting at a table on a stage presenting their visions for how the local area should be governed. And the woman in the slide here is a woman from um, a Dalit community uh, Dalit refers to people who historically were considered untouchable and are very um, disadvantaged within Nepali society even today. Um, and she spoke up to demand her rights within this domain. Now in the slides, you're seeing a couple of interesting things. One is the hegemony of the high caste men sitting on the panel, the repetition of this form of governance that's very familiar in Nepal. And on the other hand, you're seeing women, relatively young women, from disadvantaged communities coming forward, claiming the right to speak. In fact, she was quite delighted to be speaking in a very large forum. There were more people there than are here. Um, and, um, and, and yet somehow these voices seem to sort of not end up on the table, but speaking to the table. Um, okay, so going back to this question of climate change adaptation and asking this question of how can we adapt, I'd like to suggest that the right questions, and now I put right in scare quotes, because I'm sure that many of you here can try to turn my questions upside down and put me, hold me to the same standard I hold myself um, and ask some inconvenient questions. But the right questions, I think, are who decides how to govern resources? And how does this challenge existing authorities? Here what we're seeing in the slides are precisely that. Um, on the left is, or sorry, on the right is a, a slide from Kathmandu with a political party rally, people demanding their rights in the new um, state. You'll notice there's no cars on the road because they had managed to um, block all the traffic or declare a strike. Um, and on the right, you see a group of women from northwestern Nepal, considered even today to be some of the most sort of, how to say it, I guess oppressed people in Nepal, oppressed women in Nepal, very kind of traditional gender relations in this part of Nepal. Um, a lot of transformation, very, very rapidly happening, but nevertheless, some of these older ideas are quite entrenched. And they had, the last time I was there, declared their own revolution. They were calling it an Andolan revolution in Nepali. Um, and um, 
and it had a little flag, which you can see in the picture, the little red and white flag. And we're going around and declaring that everyone using their forest resources had to give them money to put into a rotating savings credit fund that they were then going to use to plant medicinal herbs in the community forest. And this was how they were going to get rich. So rather than selling forest products, which many of the men in the user group were doing, they saw that they needed to protect the forest and grow these herbs as a long-term livelihood security strategy. And this all sounds very good. And it was, in fact, extraordinarily interesting and reflective of these massive transformations going on in the Himalayas. Um, but it also brings us smack into these questions of who decides how to govern resources, whose voice can really be heard in those user group meetings, and which kinds of practices um, actually happen on the ground. Are these women with their andolan able to challenge sufficiently existing authorities in order to assert their vision of how they would achieve long-term livelihood security over that of others? And perhaps most importantly, how does this change people's sense of belonging and investment in their environments and resources? And it is these questions, I think, that we need to address climate change. So why feminism? Now, I'm sure you're disappointed. I was going to bring my DBH tape. Now, is this, I don't know how this translates into Swedish. Diameter at breast height. It's like number one tool of foresters. They go around, they measure the trees, and you can calculate all kinds of information about forests if you have the DBH. I have done this. Um, I left it at home. But why feminism? So how does feminism come into this? Why a feminist in the forest? Well, feminist theory doesn't have a lot to do with using that DBH tape, which I realized while standing in a Himalayan forest. But rather, it helps us to predict who's left out. It points us to some fairly predictable patterns of how the relationships between men and women, between people of different racial and ethnic backgrounds, and different class groups can underpin many of the conflicts over resource governance that we see today. Um, it helps to kind of show that we are very clearly in the terrain of social justice when we're talking about climate change adaptation. The kinds of exclusions and inclusions I've described earlier are often visible on the landscape as people ignore rules in an attempt to assert their needs in a context where they feel marginalized, or as more powerful actors believe that the rules do not apply to them. Um, and as my slide said, says, I think this has major implications for both society and environments. So to conclude, my research agenda is fundamentally about fairness and sustainability. I passionately believe the two must always be held together as part of one framework, rather than kind of being tacked on together on the side. Um, Policies and programs cannot resolve the kinds of questions I'm asking. They help, of course. I'm not, not at all dismissing our need for good policies and programs. We definitely need those. But we need to probe more deeply how new projects and programs to tackle climate change are realigning who has the right to govern what aspects of the environment. We're seeing this very strongly at the global scale as, as the kind of global nature of climate change is leading to calls for a more centralization of resource governance rather than a decentralization, which is something that um, was promoted through on-the-ground practices in places like Nepal as being a more effective way to govern. Um, what do these changes in governing have to do with people's sense of belonging and their investment in a s sustainable use of our planet? I think it's these questions that help us to open up our research agendas and to imagine new frameworks for tackling some of the challenges of the 21st century. The current frameworks are inadequate to the task. I have some colleagues who might disagree, but I think they're not adequate. We need to keep pushing the boundaries of this research, ask inconvenient questions, and attend to the behaviors which on the surface appear irrational, 
but which in fact reflect alternative rationalities which underpin fundamentally our relationships with environment. Thank you.